Welcome to another virtual Live Talks Los Angeles event. I'm Ted Haptegaber, producer of the series, and pleased to welcome Jacqueline Novogratz and Meg Ryan to our screen. Jacqueline's new book is Manifesto for a Moral Revolution, Practices to Build a Better World. Jacqueline is the founder and CEO of Acumen, and among many other honors, she has been named one of the top 100 global thinkers by foreign policy, one of the Forbes 400 Lifetime Achievement Award winners for social entrepreneurship. Welcome, Jacqueline. And it's great to have Meg Ryan with us with a long and memorable, memorable list of credits. When Harry Met Sally, Sleepless in Seattle, You've Got Mail, Courage Under Fire, and so many more. And one, is, one especially struck me as relevant to this conversation is in 2011, she traveled to Cambodia with journalist Nick Kristoff as part of the groundbreaking PBS documentary series, Half the Sky. So we're gonna talk about acumen and the key themes in Jacqueline's book, especially focusing on stories that matter, identity, courage, beauty, and finally, how we redefine success. So I'd like to start with you, Meg. Um, you met Jacqueline at a TED conference about the time her first book, The Blue Sweater, came out. She works on solving tough issues of poverty, uh, and you're one of the world's most famous and beloved actors and storytellers. Your lives have been incredibly different, yet here we are in conversation about her book on moral revolution. What drew, drew you to her approach and her work, and what themes stand out for you, Meg? I started the book just to get to know my friend, to get to know her a little bit better. And what I found was, was this story, a very humble account of a sincerely intrepid woman who just never endingly keeps throwing herself into the middle of the fire. And I, I was of course completely captivated. She has this single minded purpose of just helping people. So put the book down, I ended up coming to California and I, I read the rest in quarantine. And what struck me is that I realized the book is really, for me, a kind of surprising handbook a very practical suggestions of operating principles that maybe we can all use now that the world has changed so much. I mean, you can see it in Jacqueline's chapter headings. Just start, redefine success. We're gonna have to do that. We, we cultivate a moral imagination. I'm so interested in that chapter, what, what that suggested, what, what Jacqueline suggested that we somehow be able to put ourselves in one another's shoes, um, that we practice courage, that we tell stories that matter. And that's meaningful to me, you know, because, you know, I come to all of this just as a storyteller, as somebody who um, is in, in, its, in Hollywood, which I think in its best iteration is thought of as a kind of service industry. It gets kind of warped, but basically we're in the service of our audience. Um, so that's how I come to it. That's so Second. lovely. Go before, ahead, Ted. Before we get too far, um, not everyone knows about Acumen. And um, tell us more about Acumen. Acumen is not a charity. You talk about investment uh, and, and capital. So tell us more about Acumen just so we can frame it better and our, our viewers understand what Acumen is all about. Thanks, Ted. And again, thank you, Meg, for that beautiful thing you just said. Um, yeah, you know, I, I actually think, Ted, that acumen is a manifestation of the kind of organization we're going to see and need more of in the world, which is more of a hybrid. We're technically a nonprofit, but we also own for-profit investment funds. Um, and the real point of that is that if we're going to solve our toughest problems of poverty or, frankly, any of our problems today, we need to invest the right kind of capital in the right kind of character, which is really what this book is about, and surrounded by the right community, and then we make change. So we've invested about $120 million in intrepid entrepreneurs that are solving big problems like healthcare and housing and electricity for people who do not have it. And they've um, already reached about 310 million individuals, low-income individuals around the world, and in some ways are, are changing systems. And so, I would say the last 20 years have been about building blueprints um, and lifting role models and business models for what the world needs now. 
now more than ever, stories matter. Um, they have a unique, unique way of connecting us. And both of you, uh, you, Jacqueline, in communicating to attracting investors and supporters, and, and you, Meg, in your unique way of entertaining. Um, and and are, you both are drawn to stories. Um, could you both share with us, let's start with Meg, what stories are you drawn to? And what, what, does, what, what happens in a story when you're part of developing and creating it? Uh, um, I guess, I guess what stories I'm drawn to right now are different than in the, in the past. I, 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 everything just seems so on its head. And it's like um, in so many ways, rooms become empty. And the things that come in, like, you know, inter feelings I have or, you know, the little bits of plot that are actually happening in, in quarantine, they become really interesting to me. You know, I'm so interested in stories of kindness right now. They, they, t they touch me uh, just more than ever. And I have a, just a quick one, truly. We, my daughter and I were watching um, this show called Mrs. America. It's Kate Blanchett, fantastic new show. And she was so moved, she's 15, by <clears throat> the story of you know, the women's movement in the 70s. And she, she's watching and she's become now aware of Gloria Steinem and Phyllis Shafley and the, the struggles between women. She can't believe that women sometimes can be their own worst enemies and on and on. So she goes into her room and she writes a letter for her class to Gloria, who I know a tiny bit. So I sent the letter to Gloria and Daisy was like, ah, in a trill, right, about it all. And Gloria wrote back almost instantly to Daisy with an invitation to be her friend <sighs> like this is just a little story that happened just the other day in my life it's a kindness and I want to hear those stories I want to hear I want to I want those stories right now the as a I guess an antidote to all the other things we could be uh, reading or seeing or and and truly stories that make me laugh. I'm I'm I mean right now I love the little memes that are coming. These mini stories, the all the little TikToks and the <laughs> things that are coming in, that just can if you're going to go on a roller coaster. I think that most of us are going on during the day. That's an emotional roller coaster. It's just nice to have this reset here and there with a little six second, ten second story about somehow that someone's made so also in in Jacqueline's book uh, I love that she quotes Plato one second what for a moment she said he says what's honored in a country is what's cultivated there and I think that is true for the big collective and it's true in this if you're the country the story of yourself that your personal story what's honored in yourself is cultivated in yourself so that's a broad range of stories but um that's what i'm interested in right now i love that meg the what you're making me think of as well is um how do we tell a different story right now um i have a lot of stories in the book and i've been thinking about this a lot and you and i talked about it of um of talking to essentially, essentially venture capitalists. And you know, I was 40 at this point when I was first starting Acumen and, and I would tell them the, what our approach was and that we were going to take philanthropy, we we're gonna invest in these incredible entrepreneurs um, who were going to build businesses for people who made two or $3 a day. And, um, and the first thing was, obviously Jacqueline, you don't understand how business is done because I make my money here and I give it away there. Why would I give you money philanthropically to invest? And at the beginning, it was really intimidating because we had so bought a story of capitalism as you invest your money and you make a lot of money and that, and then you're a winner. If you invest your money and you lose your money, you're a loser. And I would say over the last 20 years, and it feels so powerful right now, the story we need to tell is a different story of capitalism. It's a story that we're the system, we get to decide. And I would rather be an investor who creates value 
as defined by the jobs I create, the integrity I allow, the dignity I build, and the earth that I protect, rather than just how much money I made. And so you're talking about a story of kindness, and that is so connected to the moral imagination. Like, what do we value? Who are our superheroes? It's so exciting to see everyone in New York City on their rooftops at seven o'clock each night. We're essentially clapping for people who've been invisible in the story that we've told over the last 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the new story that comes bound to this, what do we cultivate? And can we teach our children to cultivate something else that we honor, like kindness, like integrity, like their own dignity and, and that of other people. And, um, and that's what makes me energized by this moment while I'm also holding the, the loss and the grief and the despair that I see all around us. But I think our media is too focused on the latter and not bringing forth the former. Yeah, I, I see. And I see, yeah, that's so beautiful. Like this stories of beauty, real beauty, real listening, what uh, stories about learning what is actually essential, what, and being, being free to tell yourself a new story about yourself, right? I mean, I think uh, it's a, maybe a good segue into this, um, this, this piece from your book about, uh, Maybe I'll just read it. <laughs> do you guys mind? Sure, please do. Um, it's about, um, I'll just read it. I won't tell you what it's about. I'll just read it. Andrew's challenges were extreme, but they are not unique. Leaders all over the world must contend with situations in which they must navigate the gray or look unflinchingly at ugly truths to make a decision anyway. The only way to survive and thrive is to acknowledge the imperfections, to say aloud what you could you could not be trying harder and sometimes to compare your outcomes to what would have been had you done nothing at all. All of this takes courage and gaining courage requires practicing it. The same night that the young man lifted his machete and struck an innocent elder at the toy market, I flew to Switzerland. The next morning, surrounded by happy, wealthy children bundled in warm winter coats against the backdrop of fluffy snow, I suddenly experienced a sense of vertigo. <laughs> Images of the violence I had experienced over many years rushed through me, a farmer holding the barrel of a shotgun against my throat on a lonely road in Mexico, three men in Tanzania attacking me on the beach, a random guy waiting at a bus stop in Guatemala City pointing his gun at me. My brain was in overdrive. I, I thought of the man who inexplicably punched me in the gut as I walked down Fifth Avenue early in the morning on Valentine's Day, and the man in Malaysia physically smaller than me, whom I think I hurt more than he hurt me. I was always a fighter in the moment, but these incidents were rising up to haunt me. I wept for my younger self, for the friends I'd known who'd been wounded or murdered in their beliefs for the mere, for, or for merely, merely being in the wrong place. I wept for the images of the bodies of the people slain in Rwandan churches and the layer upon layer of violence that is part of the human society. Since that night, there have been other moments when an image, whether in the newspaper or on the streets, summoned these painful memories, bringing back the taste and smell of fear. The fears would arise like harpies screaming. It took years for me to recognize that I would defeat those demons, not by using the fallback skills of my early identity, courageously confronting the enemy and shaking off the pain, or, or more truthfully, just running away from it, but by accepting my own vulnerability and self-doubt. It was only when I began to love the imperfect and broken parts inside of me that I could show up with my whole self. I'm still working on it. I finally understand today wish I, what I wish I had known long ago. If we see ourselves only as victims, we risk failing to recognize our own fallibility. And this makes it impossible to accept the, flaw, the flaws of others. If we see ourselves or others only as perpetrators, we extinguish the possibilities of redemption. If we, if we refuse to see it all, we trap our diminished selves in darkness, relinquishing hopes for growth and renewal. In all such cases, we thwart, we thwart our own potential for wholeness. 
The neighbor who attacked me as a 12 year old girl may never, the neighbor who attacked me as a 12 year old girl may have been told he was, he was worthless his entire life. I'll never know. The man with a machete in the toy market may have internalized a sense of irrelevance and invisibility, making it easier for him to cast blame for his hurts on another tribe than to take personal, personal responsibility for them. Just as it's easier for the wealthy people in his larger community to blame him alone rather than acknowledge the structural impediments to this young man's flourishing as well, the cycle of violence, internal and external, individual and structural, can be endless unless we have the courage to stop it. No one escapes life without broken parts. When we find the courage to repair what is broken inside ourselves, to reconcile the hurts we've internalized and the hurts we've inflicted on others, we can finally renew our fragile world. We can finally comprehend that our individual and collective wholeness is necessarily enmeshed. This, re this kind of repair requires, requires a moral courage, the will to face fears, and to fight for those who are, who are unlike us, especially those outside our own families or tribes. So practice courage. It will prepare you for those times when you and the world need it most. So beautiful, Jacqueline. Meg, thank you for, for that and for reading it. The, the, the story came out of an incredible man named Andrew Otieno who, um, Grew up in a slum, ended up um, becoming a, a health worker, interestingly, um, which I'm just thinking about right now, because the story was actually um, about a market, a secondhand clothing market that, that served about 80,000 people. And one night right in, in 2008, after these very uh, divisive elections, the market erupted and about um, 200 young men came in and burned the whole thing to the ground, uh, essentially destroying the livelihoods of this entire community and hurt a lot of people in doing it. And Andrew knew that if he was going to protect this community, the thing he needed to do was uh, rebuild it right away. And the only way he could rebuild it when the police were gone, the nonprofits were too afraid to come into this very violent area, was to hire the same kids who had burned it down to do it. And that so often when we talk about moral leadership, we think about, oh, the do-gooders, the, 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 the saints, if you will. And then we think the people that are not those people are the sinners. When in fact, we've all got both of that, those, those pieces inside of each of us. And so I think the stories that matter are the stories that are willing to hold that complexity and that paradox. Obviously I wrote this before COVID. But when I think about the moral questions that we face now, it's at the micro level, every, I think of all these doctors who are having to decide who gets a life saved and who doesn't. These are you know, two ugly choices. There's no good choice. And that's what we have to deal with right now. That takes incredible courage. We've just come out of a period and hopefully we are out of it where we are flinging shame on each other. We're almost exiling each other if we don't feel that other people are perfect. And this is such a moment for us to see that COVID has exposed our ugly gaps, our wounds. And that's a part of being human and a society as well. But it is going to take huge courage for us to look at it, move on it, and rebuild in ways that are so much better um, if we have the, if we truly move from a moral compass that does put our humanity at its center, not just profit, which is kind of what got us here in the first place. So interesting too about stories right now, right? That we, what, you know, are we supposed to make sense of a car crash in the middle of a car crash or do we have an opportunity really to define this collect this huge collective experience. Can we start telling the story of we were all in it together? Mm. We had a common enemy. We worked together to fix it. We discovered empathy in ourselves. We discovered 
the what was essential in our lives. We discovered real listening. Can we start telling those stories? Can we start shaping shaping that story now? Can we start living it? I'm seeing that happen all over, and it's one of the great joys of running Acumen, in that um, so many of our entrepreneurs all around the world are are putting into practice what I would call the moral imagination, which is to have the humility to see the world as it is and the audacity to imagine what it could be. I'm thinking about a guy named Sam Polk, who's actually a Wall Streeter. So, I mean, there's so many stereotypes here. A Wall Streeter who saw the food crisis and the nutritious cri nutrition crisis in the world, and particularly in his hometown of LA, moves to LA and starts um, Every Table, which is essentially fast, healthy, affordable food, um, which is so valued by people in Compton and in other communities across South LA that he now has eight restaurants. The day after the shelter order was declared by the governor, Sam put this, what might have seemed like a crazy note out on social media and said, look, our mission is to get quality accessible food to everyone. And so if you need a meal, uh, let us know and we'll find a way to get it to you. If you can't afford it, let us know, and we'll find a way to get someone who can help us. And if you want to help people um, who can't afford it, pay it forward. And within weeks, he had enough donations for 160,000 meals. They started this whole system, so they were hiring people from low-income communities to deliver this food. Then they started to bring it to um, old people's homes. Then when the governor um, uh, made a deal with private sector hotel chains to put homeless people in the hotels. Every table is delivering all those meals. They're now delivering hundreds of thousands of meals prepared in healthy ways for uh, college kids who are from low-income families. And, um, and so you're watching government, the private sector, civil society, and the community, like you're saying, this is this explosion of kindness possibility, but it's not without accountability. This is a for-profit company that isn't trying to get rich on crisis, but is trying to have a sustainable container so that we actually solve the problems. I think this is what the future's got to look like, and that's the opportunity that we have in this moment. You have this little sentence in your book I love so much. You say, we are each other's destiny. We are each other's destiny. We get to decide. Yeah. <laughs> so we what? get to decide. You know, the, and we keep forgetting that. We forget how powerful we are. Um, if we get ourselves out of the way, that's the great irony. We have a, we've been taught that we're so important and special and powerful that we think that anything that's good for me is good for you. If we flip it, and this is where you're so spectacular as a storyteller because you start by putting yourself in the other's shoes. If we flip it and say, what's good for you? How do I make it better for you? Well, then it becomes better for everybody. Mm -hmm. And that's that power of putting the vulnerable first. How do I give more than I take? How do I give to the world more than I take from it? I think of these two guys, Sam, another Sam, Sam Goldman and Ned Tozen, um, who came to me, they were kids right out of you know, business school with this $30 solar light and they were going to eradicate kerosene, which was you know, these 19th century uh, hurricane lamps that 1.5 billion people in the world depend on for their light and their heat. And um, they were undaunted. And had we known what we were in for, or they, we never would have done this. But <laughs> You know, 12 years later, they've brought light and electricity to 100 million people. They have set a new standard and shown the world that if we want to electrify the world, we can. And quite frankly, 140 years after Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, it is not only insane and unproductive that we haven't figured out how to get electricity to every human being, but it's immoral. And so I think that story more than any has taught me that we are each other's destiny and we get to decide. I love part of that story, which is that uh, Jacqueline, and she's working with the Sams, and <laughs> they're working in East Africa, and the whole idea is to get light 
to this, and then there's suggestions along the way. I think this goes to part of your golden rule too, which is try, fail, learn, start over. And the guys, this goes over pretty well in East Africa, right? Except for the fact that they were able to make, the light is not only a light, it's a phone recharger, right? And, and I think a radio. Right? Yeah. And then Jacqueline brings it to Pakistan, all open hearts, right? And she gets this. She, she goes, and she says, look, this amazing, the delight is a, is a, it is a light, it is a phone chart, it is a, a radio. And, and someone says to her, well, we don't want that. We want a fan. <laughs> and she was like, well, first of all, it was 124 degrees lit that day. Yeah. And so, I mean, the cows were like, couldn't move. It was so hot. And this poor woman had like sweat running down her face, as did I. And I was so excited. So I was like, your kids, they can study and you can work in the night. And she was like, we work enough. Bring me a fan. We're hot. And I was like, I don't have a fan. And she's like, well, we don't want a light. <laughs> it's like, and you know, here I am thinking I'm the great listener of life and we got to do more listening. And she's right. You cannot sell a solar system in Pakistan without a fan, which is now what every one of our units has. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about listening? I love that chapter in your book as well, about what, it, what, those, what the adjustments that you've made to your listening, you write about so beautifully, but that what it's like to listen to layers of identity in a person, to acknowledge, to what it's like to listen, really listen. Thank you. You are one of the all-time great listeners in the universe. And, um, and I do. I think it's why you can, you just soak someone in and then you bring it out to all of us. So thank you for the way you listen, truly. Thank you. I, I think there are these different levels of listening. And I've certainly made so many mistakes where I'm, I'm listening with my ears and sometimes with my eyes. But I, we have to learn to listen to our whole bodies and recognize that often our conversations are being held on these multiple levels. Um, not just the words we say, the content of it, but our emotion and our identity. And in this moment where um, we're so tribal, we've become so, so tribal, mm -hmm. often we hear something that threatens who we are a part of who we are. And what we forget is what the Lebanese writer, Lebanese French writer, Amin Malouf talks about so brilliantly when he says that we're a composite of identities. And not only is, are we a composite, but that composite actually has a hierarchy to it. And the hierarchy is always shifting. So I might be an American woman, white skinned, who travels, but I'm also an MBA, I build companies, I'm a runner, I am a vegetarian, on and on and on. And if you threaten a piece of me, that's my, I, it risks becoming the only part of me. Mm -hmm. And I will deal with you in the way I see you. And um, I certainly feel that sometimes when I've been in Pakistan at a dinner party and the whole conversation goes to American drone policy and suddenly I'm the American in the room. And then I come back into US customs and the, guys looking at my passport and saying, you know, why are you in Pakistan? And I say, I wish that we could be more welcoming to the world. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's these different levels of, of, of my identity. And in this moment where we're Democrat, Republican, left, right, um, our religions, we've got to recognize and listen to all these other pieces of each other. That's our opportunity right now because each of those individuals is so many other individuals and different pieces of our identity give us pride. And sometimes those same pieces of our identity can give us great shame. Mm -hmm. And that's the listening with the new humility as well, listening with our eyes, but also with all the other parts of ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, it's shocking to me that we don't teach listening as one of the most critical skills of an interdependent world. And, um, something we could all do a whole lot better. We have such an opportunity to do it now, right? When mm -hmm. there's just a, a lessening of noise that we can, yeah, that we can listen so much more wholeheartedly. And I love how you delineated that. And then in your book, you say 
this struck me that, that there are parts of some people's identity that actually are dangerous, you know, that are perceived of as dangerous, that that is, you know, it's nothing I have my own experience with. I don't come across as a dangerous person, right? Uh, but anyway, it increased my empathy, increased my, my willingness to look at other people through a prism differently, you know, than, than I, differently than I had. Um, it was so beautiful. Thanks. You know what, though, it's so interesting that you say that you've never had the experience. Because I actually think that there may be moments in all of our lives where we do seem dangerous to somebody else. Um, I'm thinking of this young guy. I mean, he kind of looks like an accountant. He's done everything right his whole life. He's really sweet. He's, he's Pakistani. Um, but he was running this nonprofit um, that, that in the winter time decided to do a coat drive. And they were, they got all these contribution for coats and they brought the, and he was driving through this really cold, foggy morning and he saw a water bear, bare feet walking down looking so miserable and cold. And he thought, well, I've got all these coats in my car. I'm just gonna stop and give him a coat. And he pulled over and he got out of the car to offer the man a coat. And the man put his arms up and he said, I'm not a terrorist. Please, sir, I'm not a terrorist. Uh -huh. and, um, and he realized, how could I ever be perceived as the, the dangerous one? That he thought I was either going to, you know, strap a suicide thing on him or bring him into prison. And all I wanted to do was offer him a coat. Mm. Well, I think that we're, again, we're at this moment in history where we, we don't know each other. Mm. Just at the moment where I love what you're talking about, like if we could listen to the quiet and, and rediscover that shared humanity um, and, and, and start by welcoming each other as friends, not interrogating each other as strangers. Right. I have a question for both of you. Do you, um, I, I keep hearing from, from people um, who are saying in, in our current environment, uh, they feel like they, they, it's easier to give yourself permission to have difficult conversations. Um, you know, walls that you were comfortable being on one side or the other of, now you're willing to, 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 to tear that down a little bit and have conversations that maybe you previously did not. Either of you agree with that? Does, are you feeling any of that? I, I'm thinking I'm having more intimate conversations that there, maybe it's because of the, what's been born in, in us is this, it's just such a conscious desire to connect. You know, it's interesting to me that this, this, uh, the shape of this pandemic has made touching someone the most desirable thing and the scariest thing. <laughs> it's the same. It's the paradox. We're holding a paradox of that. So uh, it might be that we are, you know, quarantined and separate, that I have more intimate conversations with my friends and um, that I'm getting to know people more on these Zoom rooms. And I'm meeting people in quarantine, you know. So I don't know that it's um, more difficult conversations. It's, it's for me more lengthier and more intimate. Yeah, I think I, I would agree with that. Where I'm also seeing a shift is more of an acknowledgement that we're in this together. Mm -hmm. And I was on the, the phone this morning with a, a board member who was saying, Jacqueline, I'm just so exhausted by the noise. I'm, I'm looking for those, those leaders who want to bring people across lines of difference into a room. And I want to be in that room. And I think there's more of an appetite for that, even if we don't necessarily have all the skills of, you know, seeing a truth or a half truth in what the person on the other side of that difficult conversation is saying and walking toward them. But as Meg said, this is a moment to move the noise out and to recognize that we are each other's destiny, we're in this together, and that we have all the tools that we need 
if we could allow ourselves to move, to see identity not as a tool that divides us, but as one that connects us. Um, then this is the moment for more difficult, awkward, but ultimately productive conversations. Let's talk a little bit more about identity. Um, each of us is composed of multitudes. We're not a single identity. We're not a single story. Um, could you build on that a little bit, uh, Jacqueline, and then have Meg give us her input too? Yeah, I mean, kind of what I was just saying to, to, to Meg, that each of us holds, you know, Walt Whitman, you know, I am, I'm a multitude. The, uh, the, um, that is the opportunity of the global interdependent world is that, um, it's only when we dare to see another person as having many, many layers to them that we have a sense of real possibility. And I, again, I build companies for a living that serve low income people. If you're dealing with low income people, um, you're dealing with very politically driven economies with very diverse communities. And so a 21st century skill is to understand how to use identity um, as a way of connecting. We're not having those more nuanced conversations, Ted. We're having conversations, us, them, wall, no wall. What we need to do is hold the contradictions and to get underneath the caricature to the complexity and the nuance that ultimately will help us create the good society that we all want to live in. Yeah. I am, um, I guess sometimes I, I guess I could come to the question of identity um, like as an actor, right? That I, uh, I found, you know, it seems like so long ago that I used to do this, but, but one thing that I discovered in the doing, I learned a lot about myself because it never worked for me to think of adopting an identity. It worked for me to sort of understand myself as a prism of, of lots mm -hmm. of different identities and, the, the, and at certain points with certain characters, what you would just sort of bring out and expand a self. And in that, you would start, I would start to see sort of other, other people, examples of other people and give myself a permission to come and, and expand that part even more. So it really... I know it doesn't seem like this for actors, but it really is at its best, a, an exercise in empathy and compassion. And you're finding a self, a part of self, so that you're, you, you're empathizing with a way of being you might never have, you might never have, but you're doing, doing it in service to it for an audience to see so that they, so like when you heal yourself, you're healing an audience. So, it's basically a very generous act if you let it be. Um, I worked with uh, Jane Campion on a movie and uh, I remember her saying, saying to me about, she said, oh, oh, you American women, you're so eager to please. And my character was somebody who was not eager to please. And I thought, when she said that, I thought, oh my God, that's not me, I'm not like, I don't need everybody's approval, I'm not that person. But it turned out I kind of was, yeah, <laughs> because I started, but I, and I really didn't know until I was playing this character who would walk into a room and not need to make anybody comfortable, not need to make anybody feel okay. She, she was just so, uh, but she was a part of me that I brought out for a while. And I found, you know, that, that character really changed me because I became aware of how I was triggered to please, how I was sometimes triggered not to offend, how I was... Well, and that the this it actually empowered me a little bit more to stand in my own skin. So, so I guess that's how I come in an internal way to the question of identity by having adopted and then expanded certain parts of the prism of myself. You know, I I understand firsthand the how many characters are in there. <laughs> I love that. I love that. 
And what you're also saying, which I think is such a part of identity that we don't talk about enough, is that identity isn't fixed. Right. You, you kept expanding across that prism. And I think that a conversation that identity can be a metaphor for is um, what parts of ourselves do we keep adding? Um, what parts are so essential? Uh, I would use the word beauty because I love it, but what are the beautiful parts that we need to bring forward? And what parts don't no longer serve that we right. need to jettison? And, you know, I grew up in a super immigrant, Catholic, military um, family, um, very, very loving, uh, where that I, those identities were really important to who we were as kids. And you and I grew up in the same generation where we you know, saluted the American flag and said the Pledge of Allegiance every day. I was doing pledges left, right, and center. I was Girl Scout, <laughs> Brownie, and I loved it. Um, but as I got older, um, I started asking questions about all of these different parts of my identity as kids do. And I had this incredibly painful conversation with my dad um, after I had worked in the Muslim world, I'd worked with Hindus, I'd worked with Jews and said, you know, I'm, I'm really questioning um, my Catholic identity, dad, and I don't know what I would call myself. Um, I'm so grateful for so much of the, the, the spiritual education that I was given as a child, the, the sense of social justice. But some of the other stuff, women's role, and it, it wasn't really working for me. And in, in a part, just in knowing I'm really among the super lucky ones to have a parents that while he was crushed, he didn't, you know, ban me or anything like so many kids around the world fear. Um, it allowed me to continue to expand, 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 so that I could keep all these different um, religious ideas or practices um, to create something that that was uh, possibly unique, possibly not, but could pull to its essence inside of me. And it's a new identity um, that certainly wouldn't work for everyone, but I feel grateful for those pieces of myself and so lucky that I could keep expanding. And that's what I'm hearing in you, that we're not fixed as one thing, but we, we keep, we keep expanding if we allow ourselves that kind of curiosity mm. for the world. And then we can have the whole world inside of us. Question for you, Meg. Do you feel um, that the stories that are chosen to be told in Hollywood, be it in film or television, are going to evolve uh, given some of these, these themes that we're talking about here? Is there a chance? Is this the moment? Yes, it's a, it's a conversation I'm having quite a bit and it is, it's a real, it's a real opportunity and it's really confusing too. You know, I wrote a script um, last year and I think it is now like completely irrelevant. <laughs> I doubt it. I, think, I kind of think it is. Um, I, I'm working on uh, developing a television idea and the creator was saying, we, we are going to somehow try and find the funny in, in this social distancing, in this being, being quarantined with maybe the wrong person, but we're going to somehow try to find it. And uh, I know, a lot, you know, to speak to a lot of writers, I think right now, it's, a, it's actually sort of a fuzzy time. I'm not sure if anybody has a real handle on it yet. I don't think anybody has a real handle on how we'll go back into production or what stories we'll really tell. But how can we sort of not want to process this huge experience? Um, whether or not we can do it while we're in the middle of it, I'm, I'm not sure. But I, I have a feeling it is, it is a call. It is a call to people. I'm not, I think very brilliant people do have an answer right now. <laughs> Um, but I don't. The, there's a beautiful thread in everything we've talked about today and it's story. Um, and and um, one, there's a part in the book um, 
you know, and it connects to, to the theme of beauty that we talked about. And Meg, I'd, I'd like you to read that Silent Night piece, if you don't mind, and then let's talk about it. Uh, okay. <clears throat> In November 1992, several friends and I trekked the Borneo rainforest accompanied by two hardy guides, Mustafa and Gun. We were there to explore the forest ecosystem, natural and human. The trip was rough, going at times. We tr go the trip was rough going at times. We trudged for weeks along narrow pathways through dense, unforgiving vegetation. We would have been wearied by the intense humidity that kept our clothing perpetually damp, had a constant flow of leeches not jumped onto our limbs and distracted us with more pressing concerns. At night, random bugs and enormous beetles had a way of crawling into our sleeping bags. Our fresh food ran out after a few days, leaving us with only heaping piles of rice and canned sardines for meals. Yet we daily experienced wonder and were regularly astonished by the lushness of layered jungle terrain punctuated by shafts of sunlight peeking through filigreed forest canopy overhead. In the course of our journey, I began to see more clearly the symbiotic relationship between human beings and the environment. Men hauled teak and other hardwoods from the rainforest to sell across the world. Animals lost their habitat and humans lost part of the world's lungs. Native peoples could not sustain themselves under the onslaught and the entire world paid a price. Here at the source of our shared ecosystem, the violence of poverty and greed were palpable. Both guides seemed to sense when I was feeling nearly overwhelmed by the destruction wrought by human beings' thirst for things. In those moments, the guides would attempt to distract me from my ruminations, directing my attention to an exotic orchid or tangled vines or moon shadows dancing across the trunks of skinny trees shimmying in the night breeze. I'd find in the astonishing beauty around me, a sign of life urging me, urging itself to survive. I'd also hear an admonition of what we would lose if we didn't repair the world. One of our final nights, at, on one of our final nights in the rainforest, the Borneo journey gifted a group a moment of transcendence. At the end of a long sweltering day, we rested in a small clearing. We were all bone tired, unrestored by the sticky sponge baths we'd taken in a nearby Blackwater Creek. We ate what we could of our regular canned dinner and then sat silently with our guides beneath a veil of mosquito netting. Knowing we were near the end of our adventure, I was desperate to convey my gratitude and admiration for the guides. With no knowledge of Basa, the guide's language, I could express only rudimentary thoughts through my words. But if we lacked a common language, I reasoned maybe there were songs we shared. I started to sing, hoping I'd hit a tune the guides would recognize. After trying and failing with at least a dozen songs, I finally chanced upon one of my favorite Christmas carols, Silent Night, Holy Night, All is Calm, All is Bright. Upon hearing the familiar tune, Mustafa and Gun both smiled and began to sing. The others joined in, and our little group became a choir, harmonizing in four languages, English, Basa, German, and French. I felt myself extended not only to my fellow journeyers, but to the forest around us and all of its living things. Long, arduous days immersed in nature had stripped us of artifice, granting us access to a deeper level of knowing somehow. The night's flickering lights and unbidden symphony illuminated the possible, expanding my soul's longing to know all that could, all could be healed. Silent night, holy night. When we, could, when we finally could sing no more, the six of us held hands for a moment and bowed to the divinity we experienced in one another. That night, I went to sleep full of awe and secure in my belief of an illimitable Ill, Ill consciousness that binds us with all living things. I silently recommitted to work toward human dignity and a more sustainable earth. And I understood then that skills and resources are not enough to solve our problems. We must ground our systems in a spiritual foundation big enough to sustain our astonishing diversity. Such a foundation is based on the notion of transcendence, that all living things are interconnected, that we are all deserving of dignity. That's a beautiful piece. I, it may, of the various pieces uh, we've read today and I've read I just loved that um, because there's 
Jacqueline, I wanted you to sort of expand on this sense of the connection, rethinking beauty as dignity. Thanks, Ted. And, and Meg, that was so beautiful listening to you read. I just feel so honored. Thank you. Um, the, the, yeah, that night, I mean, and, I, and I'm going back, Ted, to what Meg was talking about, about the quiet now, and is this an opportunity for us as well to think about how we transcend. Um, for me, beauty exists in paying attention. It exists in the listening. Um, in a way, beauty is a reminder of the urge to live. And I think that's something that has grounded me in my entire life. Uh, you know, the tools of Meg's tra trade are around, you know, using her whole self, storytelling, listening, empathy. And those are some of my tools. The, the tools that we too often lead with when we're investors are, you know, financial models and capital and spreadsheets and, you know, internal re returns. And those are important. We need the competence and we need to make sure that we can build in accountability and sustainability to our solutions. But we've had the frame wrong in terms of what the world needs. And so the beautiful struggle for me starts with the spiritual earth in, in many ways or the frame on which we build our solutions, um, where we're looking to solve a problem and then we use that same spiritual moral frame to give us the sustenance, to give us the resilience to keep going. I often laugh when people say, how can you be so old and still be so passionate about the work that you do? But what they forget is that there is such beauty in this 20, 30, 40, 50 year commitment to the work. Last year I was in Ethiopia and um, an incredible young guy named Dave Ellis, who had never seen a live chicken in his life when he decided that he would try to build a chicken company in Ethiopia, turning the whole model on its head in a way that really listened to low income farmers and realized that if you're making $350 a year, you don't really have the capacity to be raising lots and lots of little tiny one day old chicks until they can lay eggs. And so he flipped the model whereby he would hire these agents that would raise little tiny chicks until they were egg laying age. And then he'd sell them in three, four to these farmers. It's a long story, but today they've got about, um, they sell about 4 million eggs a month or chicks a month. And um, they've been credited in Ethiopia with reducing childhood malnutrition in a big region by 11%. Um, we can really solve these problems. But this is also a story about the beauty that sustains. Ethiopia is one of the most beautiful countries on the planet. And the last time I was there, Dave took me on this hike at dawn up to this mountaintop where the, the Amharics go and do these um, morning services. And, um, and there we met this priest who lived inside a cave and uh, and he had these beautiful Byzantine pieces of art, well, art carved into the cave. And, um, and, and, and being with him in that moment and remembering why we do this work. Why would you spend 20, 30 years trying to solve problems for people who make one, two, three dollars a day, spending for Dave, you know, this young guy spending all of his time in a chicken factory. Um, but beautiful free range chickens that um, are providing something deeply essential and nourishing to people. He doesn't do it for the money. He does it for the joy, the beauty, the giving back more to the world than he takes. And, um, and, and, and so for me, beauty is a driver. Beauty is an indicator of when, when do you feel beautiful? It's when you shine. It's when you're doing what you love. And beauty is a self for those times when you feel broken, um, when you 
when you need to dance. Because if you can't find joy in this work, in this moment of crisis, where we have so much grief and loss all around us, so is there time for joy. So is there time to seize the beauty and start to build the world that can live in that place. So in, uh, we're close to wrapping, but one important thing that I think sews all of this together is how we define success and how we tell the story of success. Um, I'd like both of you to chime in on that, please. You know, again, when we came of age, because I think that the, the, the definitions of success has, have changed at different eras and different generations. And um, I would say over the last 30 years, when we were really coming of age, success has been pretty clear. Money, power, fame. And, um, and in a way, you know, a focusing on a shareholder system of capitalism did create a lot of innovation, created a lot of um, possibility and innovation, but it also um, has left us with a world that's more divided, unequal, and unsustainable than ever in our lifetime. And so the possibility and the opportunity we have now is to redefine success and move profit out of the center of all of our systems and put humanity and the earth there. Um, so that it's not money, power, and fame, but it is the amount of human energy we release in the world. And if we can start to celebrate those individuals, those heroes, those societies that are giving back more than they take, the world will be in a really different place. I, 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 I cannot say that better. <laughs> That's beautiful. It's beautiful. I mean, and it is, to, it's this perfect moment to redefine it. It's, it's perfect. You know, we've been in quarantine for what, six weeks and whole industries have tanked whole lives. Every, you know, it's amazing how unsustainable our idea of success has been. If you just, just look at these past six six weeks how how many systems are up are, are being devastated so it is an unbelievable time and a perfect time to redefine yeah and to and to lift the stories of those change makers who are are seeing around the world some you know some of the ugliest and turning it into the most beautiful um if i could share one more story is a guy named ankit argarwal because it wraps a lot of these pieces together of beauty and uh, success. But this is a, a young guy um, in India who'd been you know, taught that success is money, power, fame. And he, like many good young men, um, was urged by his parents to be an engineer in India. And so for him, success was a patent. Once he had a patent, he would be on top of the mountain. And so, of course, so driven, he got his first patent at age 25. And, and he kind of was like looking around thinking, this is it. And so um, he was looking for the meaning of life when he was sitting on the, the river Ganges, which is where he's from, in an industrial town. And his friend noticed this big float of flowers covered in insecticide and pesticides floating through the, the river. And Anka had never seen the disgusting stuff. Um, and then he was like, why? What's going on with the flowers? And Ankit said, you know, this is what we do. It's our tradition. We put flowers as blessings to the gods every morning. And um, the friend said uh, it didn't make any sense to him because people were bathing um, and getting blessings in the river. And as it turned out, you know, Anka got curious about what was going on here and discovered that every year, eight million tons of flowers are dumped into sacred rivers in the name of the gods. These flowers are indeed covered with cadmium and arsenic and lead, and they're poisoning the river and they're poisoning the people that are bathing in it. And so he built a company based on the, the, the principles of the circular economy, take refuse, waste, and convert it into productive use. And in this case, 
Um, they take the flowers every day from the temples. They only hire women from what's known as the scavenger caste. These are people that are the lowest of the, the Dalit castes that have for many generations just picked up human waste, clean latrines. And instead they're converting these beautiful flowers, roses and jasmine and marigolds into incense sticks and vegan leather. And then when they sell that, many of those incense sticks go back to the gods as blessings. And so by conventional standards, Ankit's not a rich guy, he's, his business isn't that huge, but you think about the families that he's touched, the beauty that he's creating, the river that he's cleaning, the community that he's building. And I hope that young people say, I wanna be like him. And those are the role models that I believe we need that are coming out of this coronavirus. The cool thing is they exist in every country. Um, we just haven't paid enough attention to them. But if we have the courage to redefine success and lift these examples, I think they can start to lead the path to the world we all want to live in. Mm. And that's the moral revolution because we don't need just hundreds. We don't even need just millions. We all need to imbibe and imbue new, a new set of principles based on this you know, moral framework that is not from above, but is just based on something really simple, like let's put humanity at the center and the earth and the rest will figure out. We got the tools, we got the skills, we need the moral imagination and we need the will. Can, can I read a, part, a, a few pages of your book that that just speak the, the, to your humanity, to your, if beauty is grit <laughs> and <laughs> intelligence and generosity, that this speaks so much to your, the, just the success of your nature. Do you mind, Ted, if I read it? Please do. Um, okay. Aren't you, <clears throat> aren't you too old to be so idealistic about Africa? A prominent Nigerian businessman taunted me with a smile during a 2009 dinner party in a posh home in Accra, Ghana. Around the long rectangular table with me were 18 West African businessmen and my colleague Catherine Casey Nanda. The air held the scent of Frajipani and formality. Catherine and I were at the table to introduce Acumen to potential philanthropic supporters in West Africa, to paint a picture of what Acumen was capable of igniting in the region and to set the stage for raising local funds. Catherine had already shared anecdotes of potential investments we would make in Nigeria and Ghana, stories that offered strong testimony to, to the potential of our work. That night had been progressing swimmingly. Then I launched into perhaps too rhapsodic of an address about Acumen's work from a global from a more global perspective. The man's question about my idealism took me by surprise. His words were skeptical, his tone was cynical. I was conscious of my race, my outsider status, and the larger stakes of this first meeting to introduce Acumen to West Africa. At the same time, I experienced the man's provocation as an affront to what my team and our collective work represented. Into the center of that table, with its starched and pressed linen, its sterling silver, attended by uniformed men wearing pristine white gloves, the charismatic questioner had thrown down a gauntlet. I reached across the finery to accept the challenge, asking the man what he meant by his question. Just what I said, he responded flatly, aren't you too old to be so idealistic about Africa? Now all eyes are on me. I choose idealism as an antidote to cynicism, I said, locking the man's eyes with my own. That doesn't mean I don't see the ugly or the challenges. I'm trying to picture how I would inspire an audience by describing only the continent's underbelly. Isn't West Africa much more than that? Internally, I could feel the presence of two voices, one telling me to put a muzzle on my mouth, the other one urging me forward. Would you rather I spoke about some of my experiences with incompetence or corruption or abject indifference, I asked, as the timbre of my voice gradually crescendoed, or I could, I could give a lecture about any of those topics. I could also share anecdotes of elites who talk a big game of love and peace only to let down their countrymen and women, knowing that as long as they are in the right clubs, the world will applaud their riches and ignore their misdeeds. Or 
I could recount the times I'd been held up, mugged, assaulted, robbed, and threatened. I could speak about a colleague of mine who fought for justice for years, only to be murdered during the Rwandan genocide, or describe others who capitulated finally to their insecurities and their thirst for power, ultimately joining the perpetrators of that bloodbath. I took a breath of only to stem my own swelling emotions. Sometimes I concluded there are days when I have to fight a hardening of my own soul from seeing too many people treated like throwaways. So yes, I can paint a picture. I can paint the opposite. I, so yes, I can paint the opposite of idealistic for you. But as the Nigerian author Chimamanda Adichie says, there is more than a single story. Of course, I can tell stories of lightness and darkness about every country I know, especially about my own nation. But we were talking about a continent that had shaped my identity and in many ways had taught me what real love is. Anger rose inside my chest like a clenched fist as that part of me that had committed to showing up with real love, not easy love, felt threatened. And the man that had questioned me on the wrong, and the man had questioned me on the wrong night. Or maybe it was the right one. I was in the middle of a family crisis that seemed to parallel my, our, our dinner discussion. A month earlier, my 35-year-old sister Amy had undergone brain surgery that had left her entire left side paralyzed. The surgeons had told her she might never walk again. She was in rehab in New York City, and we knew, regardless of the outcome, that the road ahead would be a long one. <clears throat> You don't want to mess with my sister, Amy. You don't want to mess with her. Amy understood the prognosis. We all did. She knew that parts of her body would be slower to return to mobility if they ever did. And that other parts held more potential. She was studying every kind of therapy imaginable, supported by a tight community of family and friends who accompanied her, aware that in the end, she was the one who would have to do the excruciating work of recovery. And my sister kept to a single narrative. You don't choose what happens to you, but you do get to choose how you respond. When I'm in the room with my sister, I said to those at the table, we listen carefully to the surgeon's dreary words, but we don't dwell on them. Instead, we walk, we, instead, we talk about the wedding my sister Amy is planning with her prince of a fiance. And I tell her how much I'm looking forward to dancing with her. I continued, some might say this is foolish optimism or too idealistic, but I believe you become the story you choose to tell. While my family can, accomp can accompany my sister, that's all we can do. Amy has to do the heroic work of fighting every day. She is focused and tough, and she refuses to acquiesce to narratives that would have her accept what may many see as inevitable. And you know what? I continue, you mark my words. I will dance with my sister at her wedding. <laughs> Thank you, Meg. I did dance with her. Wow. You're too good. <laughs> I did dance with her at her wedding. It took a couple of years. And um, I think as I was listening to you, which is kind of embarrassing because you were reading my words and I still got emotional. Because you're so good. But I think that in many ways, I didn't know I was writing for this moment, obviously. But I would say the same thing to Americans, that we didn't choose this virus, but it happened. And um, we do get to choose our response to it. And we do get to choose the story that we tell about it. And what I learned in going through and thinking about what was going on with Amy, and it was a long process um, and a hard process, is that the body is very much like countries developing. Sometimes you take a step forward and then you go back two steps. And it is that persistence and that resilience and that toughness that is required as well as the softness. Um, you know, just like with Africa, which is crazy because there are 54 countries in Africa, but there are you know, it's where Nollywood is, you know, it's the, it's the largest, third largest film industry and there's so much entrepreneurship, there's so much potential. We gotta see it and we gotta lift it. Same with America right now. It's like our foot's been shot 
and we gotta we gotta figure out how to walk again and run again and fly again in ways that are better we have to build back better and we can and i think that that you know when i talk about i learned how to love in africa when i first went there i thought i was going to save the world i had to learn that most people don't want saving certainly not from someone like me at that time i also had to learn that just like with a loving another human being we it, we sometimes fall in love with caricatures and god knows the world has done that to you at times but the real love comes from the many 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 layers of what makes a human being what what makes a society the good the bad and the ugly because we don't we come as a package yeah. and that's i guess ultimately what the book is about what the building of businesses that serve the the poor is about that we are each other's destiny is about real love which is not a soft skill it's a hard earned skill and i, I believe like you do that we will dance <laughs> we're gonna dance better we're gonna dance better when this is all over. <laughs> we're gonna dance better now. And we're gonna learn, we're gonna start learning right now because it is in our individual and collective capability to do so. And we've got role models in every community around this country. And if there's ever been a time for America to show the world what diversity united by a set of common values can do, it's this moment we can be that greatest generation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity to do this, Ted. Thank you, LA Live. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you, Meg Ryan. <laughs> Thank you, Ted. Thank you, LA Live. Yes, what this, this was deep, it was thoughtful, it was energizing. Uh, it's an important book, um, The Manifesto for a Moral Revolution, Practices to Build a Better World available wherever books are sold, but I recommend supporting independent bookstores and purchasing it from bookshop.org and also from Acumen at acumen.org slash moral revolution.